You may be seated. So today, I just kind of put it on my heart, the Lord did, to kind of stray from the gospel uh, lesson and kind of share um, a little bit just from my heart and the two weeks that I had for my sabbatical, but also uh, speak a little bit to the tragedy that we saw happen in Texas last week. Um, if you've never thought about, or maybe you had a question in your mind, it's like, well, what, what exactly is a spiritual sabbatical and why does pastor see that as important for himself? And, you know, I just kind of liken it to this. Like if, if my glass is empty, I have nothing to pour out. Well, but if my spiritual glass is full and I continually, in a very intentional way, to cultivate me being full of the Holy Spirit and, and continually being fed by the Word of God, just like I need in, in and of myself. Now, yes, I have the honor and privilege of studying Scripture as a part of my calling as a pastor, but I still need it for myself personally because I, too, am a Christian. I'm a fellow brother in Christ along with, with you. Uh, and I need it just as much as ever, anyone and maybe sometimes even more. And so I've done this on a, on a yearly basis, pretty much every year that I have been a pastor. Well, I'll go away for two weeks and I'll study a book of the Bible. This year it was Hebrews, which I love the book of Hebrews. And then I'll pick one like theology book that I'll read through. And um, as I shared in my Facebook post, uh, the book that I read through is called The Way of Salvation in the Lutheran Church. Great book. It's an amazing book. If you're looking for a theological read that's apart from the Bible, that's a good one. And I can send you uh, a link to pick that up on, on Amazon or whatever. But as I was going through it, and if you've never been to Arkansas, Arkansas is one of the most beautiful states I've ever seen. Uh, as I was traveling through Arkansas, I think I put on about 3,000 miles uh, driving through the, the different parts of the state. It was absolutely astounding. And I continued to be reminded that the glory of the Lord is revealed in his creation. And, and I didn't realize this about Arkansas, but there's actually quite a few dry counties still. And there's actually still a syntax <laughs> in play there in many of the counties that actually do have bars and serve alcohol. And there is scripture everywhere. I'll go around the corner and I'll see a big billboard. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. And you see all of these scriptures posted everywhere. And it was actually very encouraging. And I think I found the only Lutheran church in Arkansas <laughs> to attend on Sunday morning. And they were so gracious and so welcoming. And I had such a wonderful week. The, the weather, you couldn't have asked for better weather. It was sunny. It was around 85 degrees most of the time. And, and then I got through the weekend, and then it was a rainy day. I think it was Monday or Tuesday. And uh, I had really not watched any TV. I hadn't watched any of the news. And uh, I believe it was Monday morning I turned the news on and heard about what happened in Texas. And my heart just sunk. And at that point, there were a lot of unanswered questions and people were speculating. And, and as, I, as I heard some of the, the news casters and the people that were, that were talking, um, there were some things that, that I thought were valid questions, but there was a couple things that I was extremely disturbed by as to what they said. Now, first and foremost, as a dad and as a grandpa, my two granddaughters are in the back. Well, three. <laughs> the third one hasn't been born yet. Um, that would be the most horrific thing I could think of, uh, to be a parent and a grandparent, to hear the news that an armed gunman had went into the school that your children or grandchildren attend. I don't know what that feels like. Um, and I hope it's not wrong of me to, to say, I hope I never do. And so the shock and the, the horror and the grief um, that one can feel not being attached to it was definitely present in my heart. And I hope this comes out the right way. I also had grief for the, for the young man that somehow got to a place that thought that this was okay, that this was his answer. That grieved me equally, as maybe not as much, but it definitely grieved me. And one of the newscasters on the news program I was, I was listening to made this statement, and it really, it, it just was like a, a knife 
was like shoved into my heart. That animal deserved what he got. That animal should have been put down like a rabid dog. And I was like, wow. And several of the people, there was a panel of five people and several of the other people echoed that sentiment. And I'm just like, I don't think that any believer, any person that calls themselves a Christian can say such a thing. I think that there is an aspect of justice, and this is even in the Old Testament, especially in the book, the five books, the first five books of the Bible, the, the Law of Moses. There is a time when lethal force is necessary to bring down some perpetrate, someone perpetrating. And I know obviously Jerry's not here, but he knows that all too well as a policeman. So sometimes you just it's necessary. But is it ever to the point where we start to celebrate that? What happened to this young man that he lost so much hope that drove him to think that this was okay? Shouldn't we be grieved by that as well? Yes, we grieve for the parents and the grandparents and the family members. And I can't imagine, I can't imagine what that was like. But I have an idea. But I also grieve for this young man. And so I want to I go to Romans chapter 12. And so there's pew Bibles. And if you want to join me, please do. Gra- grab a, a pew Bible and open up to Romans chapter 12. And I want to look at what the genuine, authentic love looks like. How do we respond as believers in Christ Jesus to tragedies like this? Because even in the midst of hearing, the, hearing this horror, I was still there to seek the Lord and to enjoy the, the beauty of his creation. And I wrestled like... Well, do I feel guilty about that? And God just led me to this chapter. And I just want to share some of these things and and even talk about some of the things I learned in my sabbatical. And I want to encourage us that if you ever have a question, like how should I respond in, in a situation, this is your chapter. Romans chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 9. I'm going to read through um, this section of scripture. I'm going to pray. And then just kind of share a few thoughts. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, reading in Christ's name. Let love be genuine. Abhor or hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful or lazy in zeal or be lazy about excitement. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and to seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil. I think that's why that statement grieved me so much. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he is thirsty, you give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Pray with me, please. Lord, as we look at this incredibly difficult and near impossible prescription for how we respond in tragic and difficult situations, Lord, I pray that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit. May every word that proceeds from my mouth be from you and not from me. May it be in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray these things in Christ's precious name and all of God's people said. And so this opening line, let love be genuine, that Greek word literally means, and I know it's not an English word, but bear with me. It means unhypocritical. So the hypocritical word in the Greek means an actor in a play, someone wearing a mask, pretending to be someone they're not. So genuine love is not that. It's not someone just putting an act on, just putting a smiley face on. 
You know, a lot of times, you know, especially in the South, you kind of put on your Sunday best. But I think a lot of people kind of put that, that, that mask on to not show that maybe they're hurting. And the reason that that is not healthy is because we need to allow people to see us when we're hurting so that we can have help from our brothers and sisters. Because remember, we are not designed in the image of God to live apart as isolated individuals. We are created to live in community with one another. We do need one another. I know that there are generations, and my dad is from this generation, where you can't let anyone see you cry, you can't let anyone see that you're sad, you can't let anyone kind of see um, that you're hurting or that you're in pain. Can I tell you that that is a tool of the devil? And you might have grown up in that, that era or in that generation, but I'm telling you that is the most unhealthy thing and it's the most unbiblical thing that you can do. And I hope that you can say amen with me on that. We need to share when we're hurting. We need to share. We need to show that because I'm telling you, maybe there was this time when this young man was hurting and people ignored it. Maybe there would have been some possibility, and I know there's all these the shoulda, coulda, woulda kind of idea, and hindsight's always 2020. But maybe there was an opportunity that this young man who was a bit of an outcast, who was a bit of a loner, and who was teased and bullied himself, maybe there was a time where we could have seen the pain in this young man's eyes and done something about it. Steve, you and I have had conversations as you were a counselor in high school. You see this. There's a lot of families that aren't healthy, that, that don't teach and, and foster and cultivate a home that is centered on the word of God. And that is so important. There's so many young families here. I'm telling you, there is nothing more important than making Christ the center of your home. Sports are not that important. Vacations are important, but it never supersedes our heart and our desire to make sure that we send a message to our kids that Christ and his salvation is important. That we do everything we can as parents and grandparents to cultivate that genuine love in our children. Because what does it say? Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly and sisterly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor to each other. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. That be, being lazy about, about cultivating excitement. Think about that. We can get so excited about sporting events, hunting, whatever. You put it, fill in the blank. What are we doing to cultivate our excitement for Jesus? I love that be fervent in the spirit. In the Greek, it says be boiling over. Have you ever like cooked some pasta and kind of forgot about it? And all of a sudden, it's just, it's, the water's all over the floor. It's all over. It's, that's the picture that Paul is painting. Be boiling over in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And the reason that that's important is this, and I make this distinction, and I, I know I've, I've said it before. There's a difference between responding in the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that honors Christ and reacting out of our sinful, selfish selves. And in the nicest way I can say that, say this, the newscaster that said that that young man was an animal and deserved to be put down was selfish and it was sinful. Because that young man was made in the image of God. And Jesus died for that young man too. What he did was wrong. I'm not in all weakening or lessening that. And there needed to be justice. But do we just cast him aside too as a disposable person? There is not one single human being that is disposable on this earth. And I hope that we believe that. Especially about people that disagree with maybe our political stand or, or a politician we may not like. We cannot show that sort of venom. Matthew chapter 7 warns us against, against that. And we confess this in our, our confession every week. What do we truly deserve as believers? We justly deserve God's temporary and eternal punishment. 
Matthew chapter seven, in the words of Christ, he says, judge not lest you be judged. Listen to this. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I don't think that newscaster understood this verse very well. Do you really want to bring that type of judgment by the creator of the, of the universe on yourself? Instead, maybe we should fall to our knees and say, Lord, may you show mercy on this young man that felt so hopeless that he did something so horrific that affected dozens of people's lives. That's our response. Lord, God in heaven, show mercy to the parents and the grandparents and the families and the teachers and that, society, and that town that is now grieving by experiencing something that someone should never, ever experience. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. No one is disposable. The bottom line is, and, and, and you, as you watch these new cats, they're trying to answer an unanswerable thing. You understand what I'm saying? There is no reasonable answer to an unreasonable act. This young man lost hope. He, the devil got to him. How, I don't know. But I hope the one thing that we can gleaned from this incredible, horrific tragedy is that our children and our grandchildren are really important. And we need to pay attention to their countenance, their disposition. Are they sad? Are they downcast? Because I'm going to share something with you. And, and my dad and my mom never knew this. I was teased and beat up constantly throughout my elementary and middle school years. I can't count how many times I was beat up. I was locked into a locker several times. I had like rotten eggs crushed on my head and had to go home. And I understand what it's like to be on the receiving end of what a bully can do to you. And I'm going to tell you that it was, the, it was the most unhealthy thing I could have ever done to hide that from my parents. Pay attention to your children and your grandchildren. When you ask them how they're doing, don't just take their first answer at face value. Look at their eyes. Pay attention to their body language. I know all of us want everything just to be okay all the time, but it's just not. And there's pain in this world, and we need to pay attention to that. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter that the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion. Be sober-minded, be watchful, be mindful. Resist Satan, stand firm in your faith, knowing that this is happening all around the world. Paul also reminds us in Ephesians that the war, this battle that we see is not against flesh and blood, but it's against spirits and principalities and powers against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And we saw that in that horrific tragedy. And so why is this important? The church needs to be a place that resembles and reflects the answer that Christ has given for salvation and eternal life. What does that mean? It means literally that we are so assured of our salvation through the victory of Christ Jesus that the joy of the Lord, regardless of our surrounding evil and, and, and sinfulness of our society, that people can see the love of Christ in and through our lives, through our decisions, through our actions, through our, our responses versus our reactions. Through our oneness as Jesus prayed in the high priestly prayer, the unity of the church. It doesn't mean that we always agree and always agree with our, one another. That's just not possible. But we understand what's really important. What's really important? Jesus and the proclamation of his gospel. Can I at least get an amen for that? 
That is the most important thing in this universe, amen? To our children, to our grandchildren, to the people that are hurting, to the people that society sees as disposable that just kind of throw aside. We are to live in harmony with one another. We are not to be arrogant. Don't just be around the people you like. Don't associate with just the people that you like. Don't be arrogant about that. But it says associate with the lonely. It says, or yeah, with the lowly in verse 16. What does that mean? If you see someone by themselves, go sit down with them. I always tried to encourage my kids to do that. Like if you see someone alone in, in a um, lunchroom, I said, that was me. I said, if you want to bless your dad, go and reach out to that person who's sitting by themselves. Because in a way, you're actually ministering to your dad. Repay no evil for evil. That's a hard one, isn't it? Because we do, we want to see justice done, and I think there's something intrinsic in our nature and part, part of our image bearer of God that's been twisted Yes, we want justice to be done, but we kind of want justice on our terms and in our way. But what does God say? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Let the God who loves perfectly judge this young man. We have no business passing judgment on this young man. What he did was evil, yes. And we discern that through the word of God. Murder is a sin. Murder is evil. Yes. But as I said before, all of us deserve God's temporary and eternal punishment. The wages of sin is death, and all of us have earned that because of our own sin. I love this verse in verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And sometimes that takes separating yourself from someone. We're not going to get along with everybody. But if we set healthy boundaries, we act reasonably and allow the love of Christ to permeate our actions and our decisions, we can live peaceably with people, maybe that have even hurt us. Reminding that we are not to enact the wrath of God, it's God's job alone. And so instead of wanting a wrathful, vengeful type of thing to happen to someone who does these horrific things, what does scripture tell us in verse 20? And I'm telling you, we cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. Listen to verse 20 and 21. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he is thirsty, you give him something to drink. For by doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. Now, this has a twofold idea. And sometimes that person, that enemy, when we extend kindness to the enemy, sometimes their reaction is just going to be angry and to just walk away or to run away. And that's, that's their choice, right? We, can't, we shouldn't think that how they respond has anything to do with us. We're to do it anyway. However, when we are kind to our enemies and we show love to those who hurt and persecute us, Maybe it opens a door to the gospel of Christ. Maybe it opens a door for someone who is hurting inside to share that hurt so that the saving gospel of Christ can be ministered in a way that will lead them to the cross of Calvary. And verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If we allow the evil in society, which will get worse, by the way, if we allow that to distract us from the joy of the gospel of Christ, the devil has won. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so, yes, we weep with those who weep, but we rejoice with those who rejoice. And I remember wrestling on that day that I heard this for the first time. I'm like, I got a beautiful day coming up tomorrow and I want to ride and I, I want to sow into myself the word of God so that I can bless the congregations that God has called me to. And can I tell you that it wasn't selfish of me to just do that. To allow the joy of the Lord to be my strength. But while I was searching the Lord and seeking the Lord's face through scripture, 
also remembering those families and that, that community in my, in my prayers, to dedicating myself to maybe prayer and fasting for that community, and that the religious leaders in that community are extended the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to them in a way that God wants them to be ministered to. We live in a sinful and fallen world and evil will always be a part until the time we are taken home to be with God for all eternity. But while we're here, let love be genuine. Let the authentic love that was so selflessly revealed through Christ Jesus and his great sacrifice, let that be a part of the very fabric of who we are. May we be so convinced of the victory of Christ Jesus and the word of God that when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, and that is yours, and that's your promise. And you hold on to that promise with all of your life, but you allow that promise to enable and inspire you to extend love to every single person, every single person, in a way that honors God. The consequences of evil need to be carried out because it's in those consequences that might bring that person to repentance. But that doesn't mean that we continue to hate and throw hatred statements toward people who do evil things because we too justly deserve God's temporary and eternal punishment. May the joy of the Lord be our strength May we ever ever be watchful toward our children and our grandchildren and to see any pain that might be in their eyes so that we can do what we can to bring them to the cross of Calvary so that the joy of the Lord can be their strength too. Maybe it's saying no to too many events or maybe too many sporting events. Maybe it's saying no to working late or being in the field on Sunday morning. Maybe it's setting healthy boundaries to show our children and our grandchildren that that the word of God and the person of Christ is the most important thing in this world, because it is. May we never lose sight of that. And may we grieve with that community and continually to pray for them, but also the family of this young man, that they would be brought to the cross of Christ and they too experience the love of God revealed through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, I thank you for this time and uh, the grace that the congregation has given me to share these things. Uh, Lord, help us to put them into practice. Be with us, be with that community and just bring your grace and mercy. Those scars will never fully heal. This is not a time where we can say a very incorrect statement of where you forgive and forget. You'll never forget. And forgiveness is going to be a process. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. And so, Lord, just be with them in a way that they need it. And may we continually lift them up in prayer. I thank you for this time, and I pray these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said,